Hello again, everybody. Today we are going to be playing what I call Dead White Guy Bingo, um, because just about every single one of these guest laws was named after somebody that um, is both dead and white. And uh, one of the things I've done to spice up this silly presentation a little bit is I've included pictures of all the the various uh, dead white people, um, and you'll see that there's a pretty interesting crew of characters uh, that uh, we're going to be <laughs> seeing, I guess. So one of the things that I wanted to make sure that uh, I reminded of you guys is that guesses are pretty special, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and so uh, the last time we developed the idea of pressure, we talked a little bit about how to convert to uh, various pressure units. But one of the things that you'll notice is that to fully uh, characterize a guess, you need to actually give a total of four different um, variables. On this little animation right here, you're going to see the variables that we're going to uh, worry about here, and that is a volume and a temperature and also a pressure. And if you count those up, that's only three. Well, it turns out that the fourth variable that we'll kind of be talking about on and off here um, is the, the number of gas particles that you have. That's what this little button down here is for. Um, and usually that's uh, measured in moles because, heck, this is a chemistry class. Why can't we talk about moles in 7,000 different ways? So that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that uh, I kind of gave you the official, uh, you know, vocabulary and official phrases that you use to kind of characterize a gas. Um, keep in mind, the, the one thing that makes gases special is they expand to fill their containers. Um, because they expand to fill their containers, let's kind of see, we'll just like put a couple of gas particles in here. Oh my God, that's so much fun to do. Um, and so you'll see that over time, that gas is actually going to completely fill the container, that um, eventually we're going to develop like a, an equilibrium pressure. And because this is a is a, um, a gas, one thing that's not true of the other phases is that you can actually adjust the size of your container and that changes different variables, right? So like a liquid, for instance, it would be really tough to do with uh, do this with. It would change a little bit, um, but the problem is, is that uh, liquids are considered incompressible fluids, whereas gases are compressible fluids. And I think I can actually move it around here, yeah. So you can kind of see that, you know, I can compress this as much as I want. I can expand it as much as I want. Um, and I think if I really go crazy, um, and I uh, make this really, really small, then I think the top actually pops off. So let's not have that happen. So even though, um, you know, it's kind of dorky that I'm using these, you know, bouncing balls, uh, I always like to put them up in class because students can't stop watching the, the little bouncing balls while I talk. It's kind of mesmerizing. They're not listening to a word that I'm saying. So um, don't feel bad if you're spacing out right now. Um, the other thing which is really, really important to know about gases is that they have extremely low densities, right? This is incredibly low density compared to, let's say, um, I don't know what the heck this is supposed to represent, but whatever this piece of matter is in a gas phase, it's got a really low density. Um, so anyway, let's kind of talk about the, 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 those different variables that I just talked about. And we'll actually give a white guy's name to uh, all of them. Um, let's go to good old Bob Boyle. Robert Boyle was a, an English chemist way back in the day. The uh, thing I love about him was he also looks a lot like Dee Snider from Twisted Sister, which is one of the first uh, albums I ever bought. I think it was even on vinyl. Um, so that's how old I am. But, you know, I just, I just kind of imagine this guy wearing tight 80s pants and uh, screaming into a, a microphone. So what did Boyle's Law do? Well, let's kind of, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through exactly what he found. And uh, then what we're going to do is the much more useful thing. Is, and we're going to actually see what it does on this little animation. And the good news is, is that, you know, we're going to talk about uh, the, the four different variables and what happens when you change one. If you have this model in your head, it's going to be a lot easier than you, for instance, just memorizing the names of the laws or even the equations, which, you know, um, sometimes kind of trip students up. I want to make sure that you understand what's like physically happening here. So let's kind of go into this. 
Boyle's law is all about keeping, or I should say every single one of these laws, you keep two of the variables uh, constant, and then you just look at what happens when you change two. So Boyle's law is the one where um, we're gonna look at the effects of pressure and volume, right? And we're gonna make sure that we've got a fixed quantity of gas. In other words, I am not going to put any more or any less uh, gas into this uh, little animation right here, right? And so I'm, I'm holding on to that. I'm gonna make sure that this is at a constant temperature. So I'm gonna click that little button right there. And let's see what happens when I make either the volume bigger or smaller by moving this wall right here, right? Our pressure uh, measurement is right there. And keep in mind that that pressure is due to those collisions with the side of the, um, of the container, right? And so watch what happens to the pressure. Right, you'll notice that that is what's called an inverse relationship, right? The volume is getting bigger and the pressure is going down. And so something that you should feel comfortable with is kind of explaining why is that happening, right? Why when I increase the volume does the, the pressure go down? And keep in mind what pressure is, right? It's those collisions, the number and force of those collisions with the size, the sides of that container is you're really uh, increasing the volume. You're making those collisions um, occur a little less frequently, right? And so that's something that we could graph mathematically. And I'm not a huge fan of the way this is shown in this presentation. Basically what they've done is, is that they've, they've got this closed vessel at uh, 60 mils of volume. And what they did was, is they actually added mercury or quicksilver to the top here, um, such that what happened was, is that this thing was compressed, right? And so that's one atmosphere. So if if uh, if this thing, let's say, was you know uh, you know at one atmosphere and you added more mercury and you doubled the amount of atmospheres, you half the pressure. But that's kind of sorry, half the volume. Um, but that's kind of an oddball uh, way of looking at things. So let's go here and actually graph them out, right? And this is something that, uh, especially in the uh, in this kind of Chem 105 class, we're really going to work hard at seeing things graphically. Like, what is the graph telling us, right? Well, you'll notice here that this is the way that we look at an inverse relationship, right? We've got pressure on this axis. We've got volume on this axis. So what we just did was we increased the volume, right? So we went this way. And what you'll notice is as we go vertically on this uh, graph, you'll notice that the pressure, in fact, goes down, right? So this is what's called an inverse relationship right here. Pressure and volume are inverse relationship. Now this is a pretty oddball thing to show uh, mathematically. Um, it turns out that inverse relationships are multiplied together, right? What this is telling us is that a given pressure times a volume will equal some constant, right? And a lot of this comes from uh, Germany. So K is what uh, why that we abbreviate uh, K with a constant because in German uh, constant begins with a K. Well, okay, whatever. Um, so this, any kind of relationship we see from the rest of the term, honestly, if we multiply two things together and end up with a constant, that's a way of saying that if well, pressure goes up, volume has to go down because it has to equal that constant. Another thing which we could have done is we could have done what's called a reciprocal plot and we could have taken the reciprocal of a pressure and graphed it versus volume, and we would ended up with this really nice uh, line, right? And so that's another way that we can show an inverse relationship. At this point, right, don't worry about the calculation. We'll get to that probably um, in the very next set of video lectures, and we'll calculate the hell out of everything. But it's so important when you guys do calculations that you understand exactly what you're calculating here. It has everything to do with just moving this, uh, this door, right? So if we're at 8.9 atmospheres right now, and I, let's say I, I, I half the volume, right? What should happen to the pressure? And you should say that it is exactly twice that. So let's see if we can kind of approximately have this and see what the, the pressure ends up, right? And so that's uh, that kind of inverse relationship right there. That's what's told to us by this uh, equation. That was Boyle's law. Now we've got good old Charles, who it just reminds me of like a, a nice uncle for some reason. Um, no, another English guy, I'm pretty sure anyway, 
Um, and he his job was to work with volume and temperature, right? So he chose those two to work with. And then he keeps uh, the, uh, the two variables that have to be kept constant now are pressure, right? And then also, again, it's the amount of the gas that we're going to keep uh, constant here. So uh, let's see what happens, right? Well, you can kind of see what happens, right? So if uh, you keep the right amount of gas, right, the exact same amount of gas, you keep the, const the pressure constant, if you increase the temperature, the volume will be in increased, right? And that should make some good sense to you. So let's see if I can do that on this uh, demonstration over in the corner here. Okay, so we're going to investigate Charles' law here. Um, we are going to hold uh, a constant pressure, right? And notice there's actually two different um, ways I could hold pressure constant, and you'll see what I'm about to do in just a second here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to think about this uh, what should happen to all these little bouncing balls right here when we heat this sucker up, right? But keep in mind, it has to be at a constant pressure, right? The pressure can't change. Well, what's going to happen? You heat that sucker up and you'll notice that in order to keep that pressure right around 11 atmospheres, I actually had to expand the size of this container, right? And so where uh, you might have seen something like this, uh, if you ever saw the demo, which is actually really cool to do and I would do it for you guys, um, if you had like a balloon that was filled with a, a, a whole bunch of, uh, of gas and you put it in, let's say, a liquid nitrogen, right? You cool that sucker down and what happens to the balloon is it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? And so that should make a good amount of sense in terms of what those particles are doing, right? If those particles have less kinetic energy, Right? It would make sense that if this thing is going to keep constant, right, there has to be a, a corresponding uh, lowering in volume. So just like you can imagine this thing, um, here, let's do this. Just like you can imagine this thing uh, where you kind of added uh, heat energy or took heat energy away, you could have actually also done the exact opposite. And this is kind of crazy to see. Um, what you can do is, based on the size of your container, you can actually um, change the temperature, right? And so right now we've got 275 Kelvin. Watch what happens when we increase the volume to that temperature. And so you think, well, what the heck happened? Well, keep in mind that pressure has to be uh, kept constant, right? And so this is kind of like, this is a little bit less helpful to think about, I think. Um, but if you're going to keep the pressure constant, you actually have to, um, you know, I guess you could think about it as like increase the temperature, right? If you're going to really make sure that pressure is constant, right? And it's that one's just kind of tough to think about. But you can see, right, if we're going to make the volume smaller, you sure as heck better lower that temperature, right, in order to maintain that constant pressure. That's kind of an interesting uh, application of Charles' law. And actually, this. Uh, this kind of uh, action right here, that gives rise to one of my favorite demos, um, which I think I, I probably won't be able to film it because I'm not going down to UCC anytime soon. Um, but what I'll try to do, I'll try to find, there's a famous video of a train, train car imploding. Um, when you see this video, it's insane, right? What they uh, typically would do, right, is they would um, clean out the insides of these giant uh, train tankers, right? Well, it turns out that somewhere along the lines, uh, somebody sealed one of those like superheated, uh, you know, empty tankers, right? It was filled with all kinds of um, hot gas. And as that gas kind of cools down, as long as the system is sealed and you're going to maintain a constant pressure, right? In other words, atmospheric pressure. What happens is, is that entire train car goes Doof! and it just like it basically implodes on itself. So that's something we would do in class with like a, a big can of acetone. Um, and maybe if I can get down to UCC, I'll film some of these things. One thing that I forgot to mention is that if you do this in real life, right, you have an ideal gas and you increase the temperature and increase the volume, you end up with this linear, by the way, this is called a direct relationship, right? So this direct relationship right here, if you plot all these points, you can actually extrapolate back to a pretty interesting temperature, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius. That's where we have a volume of zero. 
it's no accident that that is actually the temperature of um, absolute zero where all of the uh, molecular motion, all the vibrational modes of everything just stops, right? And if you think about the early 1800s and late 1700s, we kind of knew about absolute zero. And we're, to this day, we haven't quite gotten there. We're almost there. Um, but it all comes from an extrapolated curve of Charles's law. Another dapper fellow, Joseph Louis Guilusac, um, uh, worked with pressure and temperature. This one, if we keep in mind our little uh, demonstration here, we could, let's see, take uh, the volume and make sure that this sucker is constant, right? And it shouldn't surprise you that if I heat this sucker up, I should get a whole bunch more collisions with the outside of that container or the inside of the container. Right? And you can see the temperature going up, you can see the, the pressure going up, and the opposite is also true, right? If I drop the temperature, the, the pressure is also going to drop, right? And so that's a pretty uh, easy one, I think, to, to think about. So what we have here are two direct relationships, right? In other words, as one increases, the other increases. One decreases, the other decreases. Notice the way that we show this thing mathematically, right? It turns out you show it as a division, right? You put P over T. Just like before, these two things, right? We put V over T, that equals a constant. I guess to be uh, consistent, at least, I should have shown this equaling uh, a constant here. Um, but, you know, it means kind of the same thing. Uh, so anytime you see two variables over one another and you say, well, if they're going to equal a constant, what does it look like? Well, that is what a direct relationship looks like. So we could, you know, remember each one of the contributions of these funky looking dudes, but uh, it really doesn't matter that we remember everything. And it, the reason for this is we can kind of combine every single thing that they said into what's called the combined gas law. So when we get to the very next set of video lectures, we're going to be doing all kinds of calculations. And if you hear me talk about the combined gas law, this is really a way to plug all the values in and solve for a variable, right? So for instance, I could give you um, like uh, initial starting conditions with a pressure volume and temperature and uh, give you a, a new volume and a new temperature and you could solve for a pressure. Or I could do something where I said the temperature remains constant and I'm just going to, uh, you know, vary the pressure and volume. Well, it turns out the second that you say something is held constant, you're essentially able to cross out whatever is held constant in this thing. And hey, lo and behold, P1V1 equals P2V2. That really is just another manifestation of Boyle's Law. If we uh, cross out, uh, let's see, the, the Vs, right? We say that the Vs are constant, the, the constant volume. Well, then we just end up with Gilusac's law, right? So it doesn't really matter that you remember these things separately. It's probably easier to just think about it as a combined gas law. So my, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite chemists uh, is uh, good old Carlo here. Avogadro, you've probably heard uh, before when we were talking about the mole, right? Uh, turns out the Avogadro's number was actually named after him. Um, and the, the worst part of all of this is that he really does look like a, a, a rat, right? A mole rat. Um, and, you know, I, I just, uh, man, he is, he's not somebody you want to wake up next to. Um, why would you be waking up next to him? But you know what I mean? You don't want to see him in a, a dark alley. There we go. <laughs> um, so Avogadro's contribution to all this, this is where uh, the reason he was named, uh, or the, the, the idea of the mole is kind of named after him, is he recognized, well, if the volume of a gas at constant temperature and pressure, um, it's directly proportional to the number of moles of the gas. Right. And so in other words, um, it's another direct relationship. Right. And the way that I could show this is um, if I wanted, uh, let's say, to keep a uh, pressure constant here. And I wanted to just pack this thing filled with a whole bunch of stuff. Right. You'll notice that my volume had to expand. So there's another example of, uh, of a, a direct relationship. Um, the kind of the one of the things that he noticed, which won't be that important for us right now until we get the stoichiometry, stop puking. Um, but it turns out that it really for an ideal gas, it doesn't matter what kind of gas you're talking about. The number of moles of gas is the only thing that matters. Right. And so um, that's what his uh, uh, 
you know, observation really was. And then uh, eventually we realized they had something to do with this uh, whole idea of, uh, of like the number of particles that actually uh, were important. So uh, not to, you know, beat on you too hard, but what we end up with because of the contributions of all these individuals here, right, from Boyles, Charles, even Guy Lussac um, and Avogadro, what you end up with is this fact that a volume is actually just proportional to the number of moles, the temperature, and the pressure, right? And that gives rise to what's called the ideal gas equation. And what the typically the ideal gas equation, and we'll talk about this a lot more next week, I just think of as Pivnert, right? I wanted to name my first kid Pivnert, and um, I was outvoted. Actually, I wasn't outvoted. I was just told that wasn't going to happen. Um, I guess it's not a democracy in my house, but this little pivnert here, right? That is going to tell us basically we could figure out the number of moles if I was given three of the variables, right? I could figure out the temperature if you gave me three of the variables. And a lot of people say, well, what the heck is this R? Well, I think about R as kind of like a fudge factor, right? It's something to make sure that all the math works out. For us, the important thing that we're going to keep in mind about units, our pressures are always going to be in atmospheres, our volume are always going to be in liters, N is always going to be the number of moles, and the temperatures are always going to be measured in kelvins. Right? And so what we can do because of that is that we have a very particular ideal gas constant that we're going to be using. And there are all the gas constants. The one that we're going to be using, at least to start things off with, are, is right there, right? Because we are talking about liters for volume, atmospheres for pressure, moles for amount, and uh, Kelvin for temperature, we have to use uh, this value right here. Turns out that all these other values are actually exactly equal to that, just in different um, units, right? So if we were physicists, believe it or not, you would use this. Right? We're going to use the gas constant in terms of joules eventually when we start to talk about energetic constraints and things like that. So uh, the ideal gas constant really is much more important than just uh, you know in terms of gases. It actually finds its way into all kinds of crazy uh, kind of physics of chemistry. Um, and it all has to do with this whole like idea of kinetic molecular theory. Um, so um, that we're going to go ahead and stop there. Um, Hopefully I can find a couple of cool demos uh, to either film or show you guys. Um, but uh, either way, uh, if you have any questions, come talk to me in the, one of those Zoom office hours.